Back in December, a new trailer for Stalker 2 was released, called Come to Me. In this video, we will conduct an in-depth breakdown of this trailer, by analyzing every single scene in detail and by presenting some speculation and theories that have been circulating. Before we start, I must warn you that in this video I will assume that you are familiar with the previous Stalker games as well as the previous Stalker 2 trailers. That being said, let's begin. The trailer opens up with the usual GSC game world introduction. The first scene takes place in what appears to be an underground area, possibly a laboratory or a bunker. The player's character is on the ground, and we see three other people in the room. This one wears a monolith uniform, while the other two are from the Ward, a new faction that will appear in the game. Basically, the Ward is a group of fighters tasked with protecting the scientific operations in the zone, which are conducted by the Scientific Institute for Research in the Chernobyl Anomalous Area, or CIRCA in short. The members of the ward can be easily identified by the specific patterns on their pants, and as you will see, more characters from this faction will appear later in the trailer. In the scene, the monolithian easily beats up the guys from the ward and strikes the player with a kick, ending the sequence. Also, a voice can be heard saying, thus giving its name to the trailer. This is similar to the voice of the monolith crystal or wish granter, which could be heard in Shadow of Chernobyl. This seems to indicate that the monolith might be back in Stalker 2, despite the fact that the device was disabled by Mark I in Shadow of Chernobyl. From what I understand, the Stalker only destroyed the power source for the mind-controlling illusion that was the Wish Granter, so it's definitely possible that it will be repaired or rebuilt. On the floor, we see two weapons which will be featured in the game, an AKS-74 with underbarrel grenade launcher and some sort of shotgun, which unfortunately I was not able to identify. It could be a Benelli or a Winchester, but I'm not quite sure, so if you know what this weapon is, please tell me in the comments. Furthermore, there are a few objects in this scene which look almost identical to those from the original games. The console, the chemical canister in the background, the crate containing some sort of biological hazard, and this strange machine. All of these are elements which were found in the Secret X laboratories. Now you may wonder, how was the monolith guy able to easily overpower everyone? Well, the answer might be on the very last frame. I speculate this device on the ceiling is a small psiameter, which is used to transmit orders to the monolith members as well as to weaken the minds of their enemies. We've seen such machines before in Call of Pripyat, and here it appears to be fully functioning. Next, we find ourselves progressing into some abandoned tunnels. The player is holding an AK-74U, a weapon we already knew was going to be in the game. There's not much to see here except for a few anomalies. We have the chemical fruit punch returning from the previous games, and another anomaly which looks like a large bubble of floating water. This could be a new design for an old gravitational anomaly, but I'm more of the opinion that it is actually a new anomaly. I also noticed there is no working light in the tunnel. In the previous games, all the underground locations somehow had electricity and some working lights, but not this time. Moreover, this is our first look at the HUD. On the bottom left corner, we have a blue bar for stamina and a red bar for health. Below these bars, there is some space for other indicators. Currently, there is only one indicator, a crescent, which probably means that the character needs to sleep. On the top of the screen, there is some sort of compass. 
If you have carefully watched the trailer, you must have seen that the HUD does not show up in all the scenes. Most likely, the scenes without the HUD are cutscenes where the player does not have control of Skiff, his character. But more about the HUD later in the video. Then we arrive in a large room with a huge and mysterious device that is still functioning. While the Stalker franchise has already provided us with many strange pieces of machinery, we have never seen anything like this before, so the purpose of this contraption remains unknown for the time being. Most likely, this is something important, linked to the secret experiments that were carried out in the zone and the research about the Noosphere. Speaking of which, while these scenes are playing, a voice is telling us a bit about the history behind the discovery of the Noah's Fear. After years of work, a group of scientists managed to tap into the Noah's Fear, the Earth's informational field. In case you forgot, the Noah's Fear is the Earth's informational field which is said to contain the consciousnesses of all living beings with cognitive abilities. It was a failed experiment aimed at interacting with the Noosphere, which caused the birth of the Anomalous Zone in 2006. However, this information, as well as the very existence of the Noosphere, was kept completely secret, and almost nobody knew about it, at least in the previous games. So we can wonder how, in this new trailer, the character narrating this knows about it. Perhaps the secrets of the zone became more widespread before the events of Stalker 2, or the man speaking simply isn't anybody. Now let's get back a little bit, shall we? This is a new weapon, known as the Mariuk or Vulcan M, a modern Ukrainian bullpup assault rifle. Here it seems to be equipped with holographic sight and a silencer. Also, I spotted another one of those special chemical tanks close to the strange machine. In the next scene, Skiff is once again laying on the ground, in what appears to be a large medical room. There is blood splattered around and a character is seen picking up scissors from the floor. This man bears a striking resemblance to the Doctor, an important character from the original games. While we do not have a solid confirmation that he is, in fact, Doctor, I think it would make perfect sense. The looks match, there is plenty of medical equipment around, and Doctor knows a fair share about the secrets of the zone, explaining why he would be able to talk about the Noosphere. Indeed, it is revealed a little bit later in the trailer that the narrator of this voice is this character. Furthermore, we can see what appears to be two dogs inside cages, and as we know, Doctor likes animals. He even possessed a tamed pseudodog. We then see Skiff operating an unknown device. The screen displays the time of day as well as some sort of radiation measurements. On the side of the machine, we can read the word Topaz in Ukrainian. This confirms that it is the same device we saw being carried in the previously released Under the Zone trailer. Right after that, we witness the Topaz in action. We are still unsure what the purpose of the device is, but it certainly has something to do with anomalies. I have a few theories. My first idea is that the Topaz device is creating anomalies. This right there reminds a lot of Artifact Activation, an old concept that was cut from the original games but remained in the folklore of the zone. The idea is that artifacts can be activated. Doing so would create an anomaly similar to the one which gave birth to the artifact but in the process the artifact would be lost. Here it looks like the machine is using the power of an electrical artifact to create an electro-anomaly. My other ID, completely opposed to the first one, is that the Topaz device will be used to counter anomalies, possibly to weaken or deactivate them. 
In the previously published information about Stalker 2, we learned about Arch Anomalies, a new kind of powerful anomalies producing artifacts that are difficult to acquire. Apparently, obtaining the artifacts from these Arch Anomalies will require some tricks, something more than the regular artifact hunting we already know of. Perhaps the player will need to use the Topaz machine to modify the Arch Anomalies and safely collect their artifacts. I got this idea from this shot, where Skiff can be seen approaching what appears to be a giant Arch Anomaly with the Topaz strapped on his back. Moving on, here we get a glimpse at what shotgunning people inside the building will be like. The rooms are well detailed, and the sound of shotgun is as powerful as ever. We can even read the words GSC and Ukraine on the shelves. It is quite difficult to tell who Skiff is fighting here, perhaps the military. This guy was equipped with an AKS-74. Also, when using the weapon, we get to see a new part of the HUD, in the bottom right corner, which shows your ammunition. On top of that, we can notice that the direction of enemies are marked by a red symbol on the compass. This is followed by a brief shot of an helicopter flying above. Does this mean that the military has once again the control of the airspace over the zone? It could very well be. Indeed, the army had lost their ability to navigate the zone via helicopters during the events of Call of Pripyat, because they did not understand how emissions interacted with aerial anomalies. However, at the very end of the original trilogy, they found out how to correct this, thanks to Major Dektyref and Strelok. Meanwhile, the narrator in the background continues to talk about the Noosphere, claiming that its discovery can only be compared to the conquest of space. An achievement comparable at best to the conquest of space. This basically means that the research on the Noosphere is of extreme scientific importance. It could also mean that several groups are competing to discover the zone's secrets, just like several countries took part in the race to the moon. In the next scene, we are showcased some of the gravitational anomalies. This area appears to be the same place from this screenshot, only from a different perspective. Skiff is tossing bolts into anomalies to locate them and safely navigate between them. I noticed that the way he throws bolts is different from the previously released gameplay trailer. I believe this is because there will be two different ways to throw your bolts, just like in the original games. The left click button allowed to simply throw the bolt at a short distance, without any delay. This is what I think is shown in the latest trailer, a short and immediate toss of the bolt. The right click button allowed to increase the force at which the bolt will be thrown, thus also increasing its range. This could be done by simply pressing the button for a longer time. This is what I think was shown in the previous trailer, where the character pauses a moment before throwing the bolt. Perhaps I'm completely wrong about this, but I believe my explanation makes sense. Back to the anomalies themselves, it is hard to tell if they are previously known anomalies that have been graphically overhauled, or if they are brand new anomalies. In order to make sure, we would need to see what happens if a human or a creature walks into it, but here we are only shown the reactions of anomalies to the bolts and their interactions with the environment. This first reaction reminds me of the vortex anomaly, while this second reaction reminds me of the springboard anomaly. Then we see what could be a whirligig anomaly, but as I said, it could also be a new type of gravitational anomaly. Either way, it is nice to know that such anomaly clusters will have a large impact on their surrounding environment. Next up, we have a short but interesting scene. We can complement the details from the food items on the table, 
however I am more interested in the characters. The man on the right is once again from the Ward faction, and we can see that he is not really welcomed here, as the man in the background is aiming at him with his pistol. There is also another guy guarding the room, who seems much more calm. And then we have this character, who is apparently named Gaffer. The man from the ward tells Gaffer, Don't want the innocent to suffer? Then help me find the culprit. To understand this scene, it is important to know that the ward kinda acts like a police force within the zone. This could explain why the ward man is being held at gunpoint. The stalkers simply don't trust him. It seems like the ward is looking for the culprit of some criminal act, and they ask help to the stalkers, despite the fact that they are clearly in bad terms. It is possible that Gaffer is a powerful man in the zone, with enough connections and influence to be able to help the ward. Perhaps he is a trader, a barman, or even a stalker leader. As for the culprit, it could be the mysterious stranger from the previous gameplay trailer. From his conversation with Skiff on the roof, it is evident that they plotted the assassination of an important character. Most likely the ward will be trying to solve the murder case, but more about this later in the video. We then have a beautiful shot of some stalkers around the campfire. One of the men holds a bottle, another has a branch detector, just like the one seen in the previous gameplay trailer, and the last one is playing the guitar. It seems that GSC has managed to capture the ambience of the campfire that is such an essential component of the franchise. Afterwards, Skiff proceeds to what appears to be a makeshift barricade. He is holding a new weapon, a Kiparis submachine gun. It will be nice to see more submachine guns in Stalker 2, because the original games only had the MB5. During this whole sequence, we learned a bit more about the HUD. There is this new symbol for when Skiff is hungry, and we also see several points of interest being shown on the compass. I assume these are for a medic, a trader, a technician, and a stash. Moving on, we cautiously enter a room only to be caught by a new character. This man is supposedly named Zolder, and will be a technician with the skills to make maps of anomalous fields. This description matches what can be seen in the room. Lots of tools, some sort of radar device, and schematics on the wall which perhaps are linked to the Duga radar. The role of Zolder in the story has yet to be revealed, but I believe he will be an important character. Following these, we get a fighting scene between Skiff and what appears to be bandits. There is no doubt about the location. This is the train depot from the garbage, which means that the garbage will return in Stalker 2. Skiff is using an AK-74 and we are shown a jamming animation indicating that weapon malfunctions will be present in the game. I also noticed that in this shot, there is a slight blood effect on the top of the screen, especially visible in the top left corner. This effect appears to be made to indicate that Skiff is injured. There will be more scenes of firefights later in the trailer, so let's wait to see them to talk more about the combat. The character who we suppose is Doctor is shown again, and that is when it is revealed that he was the one narrating the trailer up to this point. To begin with, he mentions that a decade has passed. And what do we have a decade later? This could mean that Stalker 2 will take place 10 years after the zone was born, hence in 2016. Or it could also mean that Stalker 2 will take place 10 years after the previous game, hence in 2022. I think the latter is more likely because the devs said that the game will take place in a modern world. However, we don't know the real date just yet. Furthermore, the character talks about the fact that the zone is shaped in our image. The zone. In our image. 
after our likeness. This could be a reference to several things. First, the zone was man-made. We are responsible for the disaster and all of its consequences. Second, there is a belief among certain stalkers that the zone is like a reflection of our actions. In other words, the zone brings to us what we bring to the zone. For example, going into the zone armed to the teeth and with an aggressive mindset will result in the zone constantly trying to kill you, while going into the zone unarmed and with a peaceful mindset will result in mutants and anomalies leaving you alone. I could very well see the doctor having such a mindset. This is followed by a beautiful shot of the Duga radar, and we once more jump straight into action. The player holds the Mariuk again, but now without a silencer. He shoots two blind dogs in what appears to be Pripyat, before being shot himself. There are once again blood effects around the screen to indicate that Skiff is injured, this time much more pronounced as the character has almost no health left. However, when we are shot, there seems to be no indicator of which direction the damage came from. This is quite surprising for me, as such indicators are a staple of FPS design and were present in the previous games. Anyway, this scene also showed us a new icon for the HUD, the bleeding icon. Then Skiff uses an healing item, which is accompanied with a special animation. Such animations did not exist in previous Stalker games, and it remains to be seen if this item is different or if all consumable items will have such animations in Stalker 2. Afterwards, the player runs, confirming that the blue bar is indeed stamina. The stamina bar is actually divided into three parts. Unfortunately, I don't know what they mean. We shoot down what appears to be some monolith soldiers, first with the Mariuk and then with a drum-fed MP5. About the combat, I have to say there is one thing that seems a bit off. Enemies feel unresponsive, so to speak. Yes, they shoot back, but they are always completely still. This is very strange compared to the fighting in current Stalker games, where NPCs are almost constantly in movement during combat. Some say that the NPCs in the trailers were made to stand still for cinematic purposes, and that they will not act the same way in the actual game. I certainly hope this is true. Oh, and before I forget, it seems dead bodies will be marked on the compass with a cross. Moving on, we have this scene which does not tell us a lot but introduces a new important character. This is Colonel Korshenov, the commander of the Ward faction. It seems that he was injured and not all of his men were able to be rescued. My men are still lying out there, and I can't even bury them. In front of him, we have another man from the ward, possibly the same guy from this scene, and what appears to be a scientist, most likely from the Circa. In the following scenes, we find ourselves in some sort of research laboratory, which is inhabited by bloodsuckers. We've already seen the bloodsucker in a previous trailer, so this is not really a surprise. Yet we can still notice a few interesting details. The design of the equipment in the lab is once again clearly inspired by the original Stalker games. We have the consoles, the screens, and this machine which is used by scientists to contain and study artifacts. We even see old computer screens. All of this makes me believe this location is not a new facility built by the Circa to study the zone, but rather one of the old X laboratories which were established before the birth of the zone. On top of that, the lights are working in this area just like in the previous games. We also saw a corpse in the lab, however I was not able to clearly identify which faction he belongs to. I'm not gonna lie, the movement of the bloodsuckers seems a bit goofy, yet I liked the leap forward at the end. 
Last but not least, the weapon used in this scene appears to be an HK416, equipped with a drum magazine. Next up, we see Skiff scavenging for supplies in a large, dilapidated Soviet helicopter. Such derelict choppers appeared in small numbers in the original games. The stop sign most likely indicates the aircraft was used as a shelter for some time. However, we only find dead bodies inside. Once again, I was pleasantly surprised to see some props being identical to their original version like this metal box and this blue chest. Also, this weapon is the AS Val, or ASA Avalanche as it is called in the games. We then get our very first glance at how the looting screen will look like. Let's begin with the items we can see, which were all already present in the original games. We have medkits, a lot of different types of ammunition, F1 grenades, bread, sausages, the Cossack's vodka, which now has a brand new tag with the image from the latest Cossack's game, and the energy drink, which is now a can of non-stop, a real-life brand. GSC had already partnered with non-stop in the past, and that is why the brand also appeared on energy drinks in certain versions of Shadow of Chernobyl. It looks like GSC has made a new partnership with them. And then we have this weapon, the Assault GP-37. If you are wondering, yes, this is a G-36. However, in the original Stalker games, all the weapon names were changed in order to avoid copyright. Thus, the G-36 was always named GP-37 in the universe of Stalker and it looks like this trend will continue in the new game. Anyway, the item window gives us various info. The name of the item, its weight, its estimated price, a short description, characteristics and the durability. We can immediately notice that there is a new currency replacing the old Soviet rubles. I'm not sure what this new currency is, though. Some say it's carbovans, others claim it's coupons or credits. I guess we'll have to wait to find out. Going back to the weapon, we can see that there are five stats being displayed. Damage, penetration, fire rate, distance and accuracy. In the previous Stalker games we had only five stats being displayed. Damage, fire rate, handling and accuracy. It seems handling was removed and penetration and distance were added. Moreover, I noticed two mistakes in this window. The icons for fire rate and distance have been switched, and there is a spelling mistake in the description. Now let's focus back on the overall aspect of this looting screen. We can see that the corpse has a weight limit of 30 kilograms. This was most likely made so that the player cannot stash an infinite amount of loot on the corpse, something that was actually possible in the previous Stalker games. What's even more, you could drag the corpse around and use it as a movable stash full of loot. We don't know if Stalker 2 will still allow for corpses to be dragged around, but I certainly hope so. On the side of the player, the weight limit seems to be at 60 kilograms. In the previous games, the limit was at 50 kilograms, although you could carry up to 60 kilograms at the cost of a huge drop of stamina. There were also items such as artifacts and special suits which allowed to increase the weight limit, so you can't say for sure that the default limit in Stalker 2 is 60 kilograms. Anyway, there is definitely something wrong with the interface. To me, it looks incomplete and unfinished, because many elements are missing. This is the looting screen in Call of Pripyat, and this in Heart of Chernobyl, at least for now. All the equipment of the player is now gone, his armor, weapons, detectors, artifacts, etc. The portraits and information about you and the person you are looting are also missing. And most of all, 
There is no cursor. My theory is that the real inventory is not yet ready, or GSC did not want to show it, because there is no way this is how it is going to look like in the final game. Moving on to the next scene, we find ourselves inside a cave. This is a burner anomaly, and we can see it already made a victim. Notice these reddish reflections, these could be another kind of fire anomaly, or even artifacts. Then we are introduced to a new character which appears to have a significant role in the story. We'll come back to him as well as this scene a bit later, but for now just know that it is him who is narrating the last part of the trailer. Afterwards, we see Skiff assaulting some kind of outpost with an AKS-74U. He throws an F1 grenade and engages the enemy, who unfortunately I was not able to identify. When he reloads, we can notice a double magazine. As for the area, it looks exactly like this concept art. This checkpoint is most likely one of the entrances of the zone, strongly defended and protected by a very high wall. Considering the position of the compass, which is pointing at the south during this scene, there is also a good chance this is the southern checkpoint possibly an upgraded version of the good old military base in the Cordon. This sequence shows a skiff hunting for an artifact inside a cluster of electric-type anomalies. These could simply be visually improved electro-anomalies, yet I have my doubts. And I have a reason for this. You see, in the very first teaser video for Stalker 2, we were shown this. This anomaly does look like an electro, but it behaves differently. In the games, a bolt instantly triggers an electro, but here it first makes a few sparks, and only after a brief moment the anomaly goes off. The developers have said that anomalies will be harder to navigate, so I'm suspecting that they are randomizing the effects so that bolts cannot be abused. In the original games, you could use this trick to pass through electrodes. However, if there is now a delay, which may randomly vary, it will be more difficult to pull it off with the correct timing. Either way, the electric effects are still beautiful at night. Skiff uses the Gilka detector, which we've already seen before, and you can notice that the number on the screen actually gets lower and lower as the character approaches the artifact. He finds the artifact in the back of a truck, near a deceased stalker who was equipped with the good old echo detector. The artifact is a brand new one, called Cloud. As it is revealed, it levitates up and down. This is actually a behavior that could be observed on many artifacts from the previous games. Now, is it just me, or it looks like a cup that was transformed into an artifact? I feel like this part is the handle, but maybe I'm just crazy. If not, it's not impossible that random everyday objects will be turned into anomalous objects after spending a long time in anomalies, just like the altered wheel and altered insulator from Call of Pripyat. We then see for a brief moment the room where the bodies of the scientists connected to the sea consciousness were kept. If we look closely, we will notice that the glass of the pods is broken, the fluid which used to be inside is gone, and skeletons are all that remain of the scientists. This seems to indicate that Strelok indeed destroyed them, as it was shown in the supposedly good ending of Shadow of Chernobyl. However, at this moment the narrator claims, You cannot kill God, just like you cannot get rid of the sky up above. The wording is not a coincidence, it hints at the fact that even though the physical bodies composing the sea consciousness are gone, the entity might still exist. 
The main theory is that the consciousnesses of the scientists merged with the Noosphere, granting them a life beyond their material existence. Yet we don't know if this will be what really happens in Stalker 2. Following this we see the red poppy field we already knew about. This location was actually planned as an anomaly back in the 2010-2011 version of Stalker 2, before the cancellation. I wonder how this area will really affect the player. By the way, a few of these flowers could be seen in a pot in the garbage depot. And finally, we arrive at the final scene of the trailer. On the left we have a group of monolithians, and the guy who appears to be their leader is the character narrating the last part of the trailer, whom we saw earlier in this scene. Skiff seems to be trying to sneak up on the guy, so perhaps we will try to kill him. Anyway, here we can see one of the chemical canisters yet again. While such details were overlooked by most, I always believed that these unknown chemicals were of crucial importance to the experiments which took place in the zone. The fact that so many of these containers were featured in the trailer makes me think I'm not so crazy after all. Furthermore, our mysterious character is sitting right in front of another of these small monolith side devices this time unpowered. On the floor next to it, what seems to be a broken piece of equipment, which looks like this part of the machine from the very first scene. To me, this setup is a throwback to the situation of the monolith faction in Call of Pripyat. After the sea consciousness was destroyed, the antennas supposed to relay orders to monolithians remained silent and the fanatics started to lose their link to their beloved crystal. Oh, Monolith, we do not hear you. The character introduces himself. Died in an anomaly, shot by loners, found with a stone around his neck, thrown off a cliff, torn apart by dogs. We can actually see the stone around his neck. Some speculate this stone could be a shard of the monolith itself. However, I doubt it, because I don't think the Wish Granter ever had a physical body. Most likely, it was always some sort of illusion, a device that clouds your mind. Still, it is quite obvious that the stone does symbolize the monolith. It appears to be a reminder of the faith these guys have in their godly entity, that is the monolith. Indeed, the phrase I am blind, but it is you who cannot see implies that this guy is some sort of prophet, who can clearly see the way of the monolith. Now would be a good time to get into some theories. Here is what I believe is happening in this scene. The group on the left remains faithful to the cult, but the group on the right does not. Since they lost their connection with the Wish Granter, they have started to doubt. They are not sure if the principles of the monolith faction should still be followed. This is exactly what happened to Strider and his squad in Call of Pripyat. Their link to the monolith was broken, so they were freed from the brainwashing and became independent stalkers. Eventually, Strider went on to create his own group, by recruiting ex-monolith fighters just like him. It is speculated that Strider's faction will be featured in Stalker 2 under the name of Noon, so it's definitely possible these men belong to it or wish to join it. We can even see what appears to be a new patch, or perhaps a former monolith patch that was ripped off. As for this character, some claim he looks like Savior from Shadow of Chernobyl, while others speculate he's actually Strider himself, which would make a lot of sense in this context. On the other side, the faithful monolithians will most likely try to stop the infidels and restore the former power and glory of the monolith. 
this could explain why this man appears to be the same aggressive monolith soldier from the very first scene. Perhaps they will attempt to repair the monolith antennas and even rebuild the Wish Granter machine itself. As for their leader, the man with a stone around his neck, there are wild theories circulating about who he could be. The fact that he's blind reminded a lot of people about one of the bad endings of Shadow of Chernobyl, where Mark I asked the Wish Granter for the zone to disappear, only to be granted said wish by turning blind. Moreover, the peculiar way this character introduced himself sounds like a riddle. And if it is, it probably means we should be able to solve it. So I searched for a known character who could fit these criteria, and the best I could find was Scar, the protagonist of Clear Sky. Scar survived multiple emissions, which could be considered as anomalies. Lebedev told him, You acquired some, let's say, unusual abilities, which help you survive anomalous activity that would literally tear anyone else down to atoms. Scar was also shot by loners at least once, in an ambush set in the Red Forest by Strelak. Scar reached the center of the zone, so he could have been recruited in the monolith faction. Finally, Lebedev also told to Scar, You nearly got torn into shreds by a pack of pseudodogs, but our boys got you out just in time. The only element I could not find anything about is thrown off a cliff. No, don't get me wrong, I am not saying that this character is Scar. He does not really look like him and most likely everything I just said is completely wrong. But it's still an interesting thing to think about, and I'm sure you have some theories of your own, so don't hesitate to share your opinion in the comments below. Adding on to the whole monolith thematic of the trailer, some believe the protagonist, Skiff, could be a former monolith stalker. How would he be able to witness this scene if it wasn't the case? Others claim he might be an agent, similarly to the marked one in Shadow of Chernobyl. This is because the Enter the Zone trailer showed what we believe is Skiff being transported in a truck in scenes comparable to the death track introduction from the original game. We've yet to learn more about Skiff and who he really is, but it's even doubtful we will learn much. If anything, the protagonists of the Stalker games always remained largely mysterious to us. On a totally different note, it is also speculated that another new faction will appear in the game, a group composed of stalkers who will oppose the ward and the circa. In the ending of Call of Pripyat, we learned that Strelok, the legendary stalker, became part of the circa as its chief scientific consultant. And in a previously cancelled version of Stalker 2, the plot would have included the death of Strelok. Therefore, many fans suspect that Strelok will once again be involved in the story, and believe he will be a target for this new antagonistic faction. The main theory is that the stranger from the rooftop scene will be a member of this group, possibly its leader, and he planned the assassination of Strelok. As it is made clear from the conversation, Skiff was present when the murder took place, as he confirmed the victim did not suffer. What if this scene takes place right after the assassination, and the body lying next to us is Strelok or whoever was shot down? This could explain the reaction of the doctor. I've also seen some claiming that Skiff could have been the culprit himself, but I doubt it. He would not have questioned the decision of the stranger if he was. Still, Skiff is somehow involved. Meanwhile, the ward will naturally be upset about the assassination and will try to solve the case by asking the stalkers for help. 
To conclude, this trailer presented two main narratives which will be featured in Stalker 2. On one hand, the monolith faction will be there, most likely divided between the faithful members, led by the man with the stone around his neck, and the members who started doubting the monolith and who possibly will join Noon, a group led by Strider. On the other hand, we will see the Ward and the Circa being targeted by an opposing group of stalkers, probably led by the Stranger, and a struggle will take place between these factions. And of course, the main protagonist, Skiff, will be heavily involved into all of that. Obviously, all of this remains pure speculation, so don't get too excited about this. Time will tell if this is what is truly going on. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video, I thank you for watching, and good hunting, stalker.